Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening for the Music of Neuroscience program. Um, music moves the heart, it taps into our emotions and plays at the edges between conscious and unconscious thought. It could make you weep, make your hair stand on end, and it could provoke you to feel like dancing. Just as your muscles respond to gravity, so does your body and sense to res and respond to natural sounds from the world around you. But what are the neural correlates of these emotional responses? This evening, Dr. Barrow will explore the latest neuroscience of emotion and our current understanding of how musical experience fits into that construct. Examples will be taken from Dr. Bearer's and other researchers' scientific discoveries, as well as the philosophy of emotion and the poetry of the Native American healing rites. We have a great program planned for you this evening. I have just a few housekeeping items. The program will have an audience participation piece in the key of B flat. You will need headphones um, if you would like to participate to avoid feedback. Also, unless otherwise prompted, it's best to stay muted during the program. Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce Dr. Bruce Alberts, um, who will uh, introduce Elaine. Uh, I'm Bruce Alberts. I uh, was, was long a professor. I'm still back as a professor after leaving for Washington for 12 years from 1993 to 2005. But in 1986, I had a laboratory of, of uh, maybe 10, 10, 10 postdocs and graduate students, something like half of them were female. And all of us, uh, that may be the reason why Elaine came up to me suddenly and said she wanted to work for me as a postdoctoral fellow. I, I never asked her why she did this. Uh, it also might have been because I had a lab full of people doing all kinds of weird things, and she knew that I wouldn't tell her what to do, <laughs> that she could explore. I had people working on everything from uh, biochemistry of DNA replication to uh, fruit fly embryo uh, 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 development and structure to, to even eventually chick limbs. So uh, Elaine came to my laboratory because I was curious, of, you know, she I realized that she had all these great talents. I thought that you know, maybe she could do something uh, of her own design would make a difference. Also, I thought I could help her because the one thing she didn't yet know, and she knew almost everything, but, but uh, was any biochemistry. I'm a biochemist and didn't know about protein purification and she wanted to learn that. So I felt that uh, my lab could help. So, so it turned out that she uh, made use of all her own resources, of course, she decided to work on platelets. She um, looked at how they uh, construct their membranes, uh, a precursor to her later interest in neuroscience, which was always there, but at the time I think was too hard to pursue. And um, she used a tool that we had developed in my laboratory uh, as a biochemist, and a, pro a protein column made out of a very um, abundant and important molecule, the actin filament that, that structures all of your cells. And we used affinity chromatography to see how that filament was manipulated and used inside the cell because it's directed to what it should do by many, many other proteins, hundreds of them. And, and Elaine eventually discovered um, a protein which is now called captain which is a fascinating protein and she and others have found out it, it's some there are human uh, diseases that are caused by deficits in this protein. But I did some research uh, while I was preparing for this and I discovered there's a lot of great biochemical experiments left Elaine to do with this protein. <laughs> what does it bind to? What, you know, that whole, uh, it's, it's got great uh, features that uh, somebody should be working on and maybe you could find some young person to take this up. At any rate, um, Elaine was always doing more than one thing, uh, usually four things. She, rather than just doing a postdoctoral fellowship with me, she was simultaneously doing a fellowship in pathology, which was her background. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if she slept at all. In addition, of course, she was composing music. And near the end, she was also raising young children. So I'm sure she wasn't sleeping, but 
at any rate, uh, it's been a, a wonderful, uh, the pull of her career since she's been very successful and uh, you'll hear more about that from her directly. Thank you. So, so Bruce, thank you for this lovely introduction. Um, yeah, I, I was doing too many things in your lab and I remember one of your coaching moments was to tell me to focus, focus, focus. And um, I think I was pretty focused um, uh, because I got a lot done and I focused on each thing when I was doing that thing. So we received a number of questions from the participants uh, for this talk and I've tried to incorporate some answers in my talk. At the end of the talk, I'm not going to take any answers from the participants. Instead, we're going to have a chance to uh, try to uh, make some music all together through Zoom, which is very challenging. And then we have uh, a group of esteemed uh, um, uh, panelists, two of whom were graduate students at the same time as I was at UCSF and are alums now. One is on the faculty at UCSF now, um, and the other is at Woodhull and going back to his job in Wisconsin later um, in the summer. And they are gonna talk about, they're gonna answer some of the questions that the participants submitted and talk about their feelings about music. And then we have a very important person, David Harrington, who's the founder of the Kronos Quartet, the string quartet um, that is San Francisco's and maybe the world's premier quartet, mm -hmm. who will also talk to us about some of the themes that I'm going to bring up in this talk. Um, so this has been my lifelong quest. What is the biological basis of the mystical experience? And I think the burning question for me, the biggest question, was where does the musical imagination lie? Where in my self uh, might this imagination come from? And I started this quest long ago when I was an undergraduate at Stanford and I started doing science after long being uh, a musician. And I was a professional musician before I went to medical school. Um, one, of the, one of my uh, mentors at Stanford was John G. Nichols, who's, whom I've written some pieces for, and he introduced me to Hermann Helmholtz and his ideas on the sensation of tone on the ear. And, and Helmholtz uh, was a German from the last century who was very interested in how the physics of sound programmed the, the ear and how the, the cochlea and the sensory epithelium worked. This has been a huge uh, mathematical problem. The cochlea is a circular, it's this, this circular uh, bony piece inside the inner ear. And inside the cochlea, there's membranes that vibrate in response to sound waves. And within these membranes, there are these interesting hair cells that project what are called stereocilia up that touch the tectal membrane, which is here. And as the sound waves go through this circular cochlea, they displace these stereocilia, and that causes an electrical potential in the hair cell, which is transmitted along the cochlear nerve. So one of the questions that Lutilny raised about how this works was, let's see, hmm, it's not working. Let's see what happens when I do this. I can't advance for some reason. I wanted one more picture there. Can we go back to here? And this is Lutilny's work looking at the cochlea actually of a chick, which is uh, linear and not circular. And he noticed that the length of the stereocilia differed depending upon what pitch they were going to respond to. So one of the things I became curious with Bruce's wonderful actin, filamentous actin chromatography was what are the proteins that mediate the length of these stereocilia that they can respond to different, to different pitches? And I came up with these ideas of many different interacting proteins, nucleators that extended the actin, created the actin filament and extended it, capping pro proteins that determined its length, severing proteins that could nucleate new filaments, and stabilizing bundling proteins that could bundle the actin into the stereocilia. And Bruce's uh, affinity chromatography gave me an opportunity 
to find those proteins. I'm going to try to put this um, into this and see if it will work. Yes. So um, we would put an extract, and in and most of the people in Bruce's lab were looking at Drosophila embryo extracts, and they would put these over the filamentous actin column and some kind of a control column. I used a G actin coupled column with no filament. And then we would elude it with ATP because we knew that myosin was an ATP sensitive actin binding protein, so we would get myosin and anything else that was um, ATP uh, sensitive. And then we could elute with, and I don't know why it won't go any further, we could elute with salt and we get different proteins off. And then learning biochemistry, I could run gels and see what it was we got. And uh, this is a gel of what we could get off. And I found two interesting proteins. There's a lot behind the story that I'm not going to be able to have time to tell you all about today because I want to get to some even more exciting answers. But ARF2 turned out to be a protein that, well, 2E4 turned out to be at the tip of the stereocilia and is a nucleator that can activate actin polymerization. And uh, ARP2 turned out to be at the other end of the stereocilia and stabilized the, the, the pointed end of the actin filament. And we can see that really well here because this is Z01, which is a, a protein that binds to the uh, connectors between two hair cells. And this is where we see in a confocal imaging, this is where we see the ARP2. So we found the proteins that bind to both ends of the actin filament. And this is very cool. And did we find them in human? Yes. I, because, partly because, ooh, I don't want to do that. Partly because I was in Bruce's lab during the time when he was working on the Human Genome Project, I thought it would be really cool to find out where these, where these genes might map on the human gene. I was getting my protein extracts from platelets, human platelets, which meant that I had purified human proteins. I had made antibodies to human proteins. And I could then look where were these proteins located on the human uh, chromosome. And working already in, in New Mexico with Los Alamos lab, I was able to map them onto chromosome 19. And then in a collaboration with uh, an otolaryngologist in Iowa who had collected a number of families with different types of deafness, we were able to map how this protein was inherited through a family of violin makers who became deaf in midlife. Um, so we found that it was on the, it, it was not actually in the coding domain of this protein. The mutation is in an upstream region that's highly conserved, but it's a simple um, deletion mutation. And, and now many people, in fact, I just looked it up in preparation for this talk, and there have been four papers published on this protein in the last three months. So other people are interested in it and what it does. But I can't, became frustrated with trying to understand the sensory epithelium. What I really wanted to know was how does music activate my imagination? And I didn't think my sensory epithelium protein, body proteins, were going to tell me that answer. So I took a look at what is the simplified pathway that sound gets from this cochlea into the more complex regions of the brain. So here's the sensation coming in, but it has to go through the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nucleus in the brainstem. And then guess what? It travels back and forth through the superior olivary nucleus, and there's a lot of uh, signal uh, processing that happens in there. Then the signal gets propagated up into the inferior colliculus, also in the midbrain, and then into the medial geniculate. And this is called the auditory tectum. And then up, up through the medial geniculate, it goes to a lot of places, the striatum which um, is considered, which contains some parts of the limbic system. And more recently, it's been found that it travels to the amygdala and the ventral tegmental area, also part of the limbic system that is our emotional response engine. And finally, the signal goes into the auditory cortex, where it gets propagated throughout the brain with information about what you're hearing, how you consciously know what you're hearing, you can interpret it as language or as music or as some scary sound that you need to respond to, which may go through the amygdala. So 
I started thinking about studying propagation and, and we, we, I, I moved to Brown University in 1991 from UCSF and I was only an hour's drive away from this wonderful place, which is called the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. I set up a collaboration with Tom Reese, a neuroscientist, and who, has been, who had been a co-author on the discovery of kinesin, the first microtubule-based motor present in squid axons. And so I started working on squid. And uh, here's Lollygopelii, and we published a number of papers. I'm citing one that my graduate student, Joe DeGeorge, is my very first graduate student, and Tom Reese and I published in Molecular Biology of the Cell in 2002. We managed to isolate the axon and ex actually extrude its axoplasm. And Bruce, we did biochemistry on this tiny seven microliter droplet of axoplasm. And we were able to identify a variety of motors. Um, Joe and I dis d discovered some myosin motors from this tiny bit of, of axoplasm. And Joe went on to s find other motors when he did his postdoc with Tom Reese. One of the exciting things we found about axonal transport is that amyloid precursor protein, which is uh, the precursor for amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease, that this protein encodes an anterograde transport uh, receptor. And if we take peptides from this protein and conjugate them to plastic fluorescent beads and inject them into the axon, and these are 100 nanometer beads, we can watch the beads travel in the living axon. So we were able to do this reconstitution experiment to prove that amyloid precursor protein encoded an anterograde transport receptor. We're still arguing a little bit about which motor this APP recruits. We think it may be more than one, and there's some beautiful work from Shirmali Gunawardena from, Larry, uh, from Larry's lab, uh, who has shown that both uh, kinesin-1 and dynein are bound to amyloid precursor protein and Drosophila larva. But again, this project, while it was exciting and we made some cool discoveries, was still not headed in the right direction for me. I wanted to know more about the brain. So to go back, we now, we've now made some discoveries in the cochlea. I've made a little bit of discoveries in propagation. But how do we get at all of this processing that happens when we listen to either words or language or music. So one of the people who attracted my attention is Joseph Ledoux. And he had a, a very interesting paper in 1994 in Scientific American. What he was looking at is this, this standard conditioning, but everybody on this audience knows about Pavlov's dogs. And this standard conditioning is sort of like the Pavlov dog. What we do is we give a sound to a rodent and we give the sound, and the rodent doesn't do anything. It doesn't really notice the sound. But if we give the sound plus a foot shock, and Pavlov gave it to the dog plus food, the rodent will then learn to react to the sound as if the foot, lock, foot shock was happening. So Ledoux looked at where is that memory encoded in the brain? And he did it with ablation experiments, which um, have been one of the mainstays of understanding the auditory system. So he, he saw this is an intact mouse. The sound comes in. There's an auditory midbrain, which I described to you. Then there's the auditory thalamus. And then there's the auditory cortex. So he ablated first one and then the other. And none of these kept the, the rat from being able to understand that the sound meant it was going to get a foot shock. So in his Scientific American article, Joseph Ledoux said, I don't know, where is this unknown location that is responding to the sound so that the animal knows that there's something dangerous happening? And subsequently, Ledoux showed that this danger seeking, danger understanding memory place was the amygdala, which is a part of our, of our limbic system and of the rat's limbic system. Another thing that inspired me for the work I'm gonna show at the end of this talk was uh, Gilbert Gottlieb's work in uh, ducklings hearing. And um, you may know of Conrad Lorenz, who won the Nobel Prize for saying that ducklings will imprint on the first thing they see after hatching. Well, it turned out that Lorenz was looking at ducklings that were raised in the laboratory with no cackling, quacking mother to listen to as their ears developed. And what Gottlieb showed is that if he looked at wood 
Flint ducklings in the wild with their mother sitting on the nest, they recognized the mother immediately upon hatching and did not need a visual cue. Their ear was developing. He discovered this again. Um, he discovered this again by ablation experiments of ducklings in the egg. He developed a way that he could keep them live and with their mother after ablating parts of the auditory system. I believe the same thing is happening in humans. And I, I wrote a paper about this in 2010. Um, what is the first sound that we really hear? This is a, a mouse. This is a, a mouse embryo heart beating. This is one of the valves. And the recording is from a human heart recording that I made. This was made by one of my friends and collaborators, Scott Fraser, whose lab I went to in 2004 to do a, a sabbatical from Brown. So another thing I promised to talk about was uh, how does the, these early sounds, how do they get translated into opera? Why does opera make grown men weep? And another one of my inspirations is from Bill Beeman, who's an anthropologist. He was at Brown and he moved to be um, head of the anthropology department at University of Minnesota. He was interested in how the cries of infants mimic the sound of opera singers or if you could say that in the alternate way, opera singers are mimicking the sounds of infant cries. This is a formant, which is a complicated mathematical transfer, transform of auditory si signals. And these are the regions that appear to attract the human empathy uh, feeling. And these are the same uh, auditory patterns that infants cry. You can read more about this in Italian, if you're good at Italian, <laughs> because a lot of this work has not been funded very well in the US, and many of it has been written in foreign countries. Um, this is the latest paper, which, is, um, which was published in 2007 on this that I have. So it, is this relevant, and can we study this kind of thing in animal models? Because it would be really nice to have an animal model that we could study deep brain responses to auditory signals. And I was very excited to meet Robert Frumkin from NYU just two years ago at Caltech when he gave a talk about how infant mice makes cries that their mother responds to. And this paper has just been published in the last few months in, in Nature. And he, this is from his website. And he's been looking at how the, how the mouse mother learns to respond to the infant cries and what kind of emotional response the mother experiences. So what I've been talking about up to now, I think circles around the idea that our physical world shapes our brain. And um, uh, we can go all the way back to Plato to think about that. The process of the physics of sound, it probably our evolution must have programmed us to hear what's around us in our, in our universe, but probably not the whole universe, just in our neighborhood. So um, there's several books called um, Music of the Spheres, and we're going to try a Music of the Spheres today um, at the end of my talk uh, when we try to sing all together in the key of, uh, a key of B flat. So what is this physics of sound that I've been kind of touching on less seriously up till now? The physics of sound in Western thought has to do with what we call either the overtone series or the harmonic series. And this starts with a low note. And it builds upon that low note a series of vibrations. You can hear this overtone series on a piano if you hold one the pedal down that lifts the dampers and mm -hmm. press the low, low note. And you will see that other notes, other strings will vibrate sympathetically to that low note. Of really, really most significant interest is how those notes get very close together the higher up you go. So while the uh, overtone series is far apart at the bottom of, of the frequency, it becomes closer and closer together as you reach the higher notes. This principle was used to tune trumpets and trombones so that they could play harmonics over a very low note. And if you play those instruments, you know that they're mostly made on the length of a B flat. And the reason they're made on a B flat is so that these overtone notes 
would match better with the string player's easily played notes. And now I'm going to play a little bit of one of my pieces that I wrote for John Nichols. And this is just a taste. This is available from Amazon.com. And this is the first movement. OK. So stop me if you can't hear it. No. Did that work? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I have a few more. So uh, uh, I, I think David Harrington must be chuckling because that's uh, that's really a ripoff of of one of Beethoven's quartets, Opus 18, number two, but it's not in the same key, and it's done actually quite differently. But if you know both of them, you might recognize you might recognize um, my uh, I I wrote it. Uh, Sopra Beethoven, because that was one of John Nichols' favorite composers, but I wanted to write a tribute to him. So here's that overtone series I told you about. And if you listen to this piece, we really played with these lower parts of the overtone series. This is the seventh, and we would use that as a dominant seventh. But up here, here's the ninth. We get that in jazz a lot, but not so much in Beethoven. So somebody asked me about global music, and I just talked about Western music. And uh, there have been a lot of anthropology studies that have said, well, global music is really different, and there's lots of different scales, and, they, and so there's no general human musical ethic, musical tonal, tonality. Recently, um, there's, a, there's a group in Amsterdam in the Netherlands called the Organization of Scientific Research that's in working on a thing called the Vinci Program, and they're trying to integrate comp cognition. And what they use mathematics. Now, a lot of people have used mathematics to try to understand music. And a lot of the <laughs> mathematics is pretty dense. And I'm not sure it really explains what how, our emotional response to music. But I really liked what these people showed because they used a coordinate system called the Euler lattice, and they, which, which can be used to study multidimensional objects. And they took a 1,000 scales from all over the world, from Japan to Indonesia, and from contemporary composers who think they're writing new scales, which seems like, why would you want to do that? But some composers want to do that. And they found that they all fit into the same Euler lattice. So there is some part of this musical scale business that we're doing that is universal. But then we come to what happens when we think about these weird scales. And we ended up in the, after World War I, we ended up with a thing I call the intellect intellectualization of musical composition. Some of you know that Albert Einstein was a violinist, but he was a good friend of Arnold Schoenberg. And here's a photograph of the two of them getting together. They proposed this mathematical music, and Schoenberg went off into the 12-tone atonality. He said that pitch and tone were a hegemony, and they were strangling musical in, in imagination. And this inspired Hollywood. And Hollywood was inspired to do things like this. Was that too loud? Well, I'm not going to play more of that because it's pretty harsh. But that was a very successful movie, and those sounds were very frightening. But they drove the audience out of the concert halls, and we started losing our orchestras for music that didn't appeal to our emotions. So some people have started using magnetic resonance imaging, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to try to understand how humans respond to consonant versus dissonant music. And this is a very early study from Tillman et al. in 2003, where they played consonant, consonant sounds, and just consonant sounds, not music, not a whole interesting piece, but just consonant sounds, or dissonant sounds. And they asked, what parts of the brain light up with these different sounds? And what was interesting to me about this study was that different parts of the brain light up for different types of sound. So what you just listened to, that 
uh, that shrieking from psycho probably activated different parts of your brain than my little Beethoven lookalike. <laughs> Even more recently, um, Zator, Robert Zator, who's up in Montreal at the Neuro, Neuro Institute in Montreal, has been using and has developed a lab just to look at these musical things. And some of the things that I've been really excited about that he's found is, again, the pleasurable responses to familiar music light up some discrete places in the human brain. And these are not in the higher auditory pathway that we've de defined but rather in the striatum and in the ventral tegmental area and the ventral striatum. And then when the music is novel, even more places light up. But again, it's in the striatum. It's, it's in the deeper brainstem, which is similar between us and, and other animals, other mammals. They did a very interesting study using PET to look at dopamine. And they had people listening to pleasurable music and then they looked with PET scanning to what the dopamine release is. And I think everybody in this, in this group knows what dopamine is. It's thought to be one of the targets of cocaine. It's thought to be one of the things that makes, um, that makes our, 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 us react to, to addiction. It, it's a pleasure hormone. And it looks like music activates dopamine release in places in the brain. And again, I'm going to point out some... The striatum is here. I'm not, I'm not seeing it immediately on this. Again, these people have defined this map of the human brain's response to pleasurable music, and it's all located in the brainstem and the limbic system. And now I'm going to play another one of my pieces. So that went from something very aggressive and active to something more pleasurable and, and melodic. And if we play back and forth those kinds of things, what happens to this dopamine system and the flip from familiar to unfamiliar? And how much does a composer play with those feelings? These are dynamic feelings that are going back and forth in your brain while you listen to a complicated piece of music. So I'm skipping to another topic that people ask me about, and I found this paper very exciting. It came out in 2015, and there have been follow-ups on it. Um, again, using magnetic resonance imaging and PET scanning, this group in Utah was able to map the musical memory. So this is where familiar memory, and I showed that in the previous slide. This is pretty much a consensus that familiar memory lives somewhere here in the cortex of familiar music. And then they looked at people with Alzheimer's disease. And you know that people with Alzheimer's disease can remember songs. I had a chance to work with Glenn Campbell while he was dying of Alzheimer's disease. He could still sing his wonderful songs, at, even when he could not remember his wife's name or even recognize her. But he could sing his songs and play his guitar. And we think that's because the memory lies here. And this isn't an area of the brain that's, that's damaged by Alzheimer's. We don't get gray gray matter atrophy here, and we don't get hypometabolism uh, here, and we don't get amyloid plaques in this region. So this is a part of the region of the brain that seems to be preserved by the whatever the Alzheimer's process is. So Alzheimer's disease is teaching us something about the brain, 
But I don't think we yet know how to use music to, to do therapy for Alzheimer's. We need to know a lot more about what music actually does in the brain before I think we're gonna be able to do effective therapies. So now at the very last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about some work that I'm doing right now. I'm very interested in how the human brain and the rodent brain are similar so that I can use my mouse models to understand something about the interaction between um, the, the monoaminergic system, the dopamine noradrenergic systems, and the limbic system. And this is a diagram from Nora Falco's work, who's the director of the Na National Institute for Drug Abuse. And she has shown that the, these regions of the mouse brain, which are up here in the prefrontal cortex, connect into the limbic system and have reciprocal connections from it. What we also see is that the neuroadrenergic system located in the locus ceruleus also connects into this uh, prelimbic system in the brain. So this is a very important regulator unit that is present in both mouse and human brain that communicates deep into, the, into our emotional circuit. During a sabbatical in 2004 in, in Scott Fraser's lab, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with Russ Jacobs on this 11.7 MR scanner. And we could, it's, this scanner is big enough so that we could watch mouse brains. I have some uh, recordings of what it sounds like in the scanner. I won't play them. If you've ever had an MR, you know that it's really loud. So it's kind of hard to do music in a scanner, although some people have managed to report some things. Mouse brains are really tiny, and I usually ask my students if they can identify which is the mouse brain. And we made a joke that this was a presidential debate. <laughs> and we, we, because the mouse brain is so small, we had to set up microscopes to inject so that we could trace circuitry. So we trace circuitry in the dopamine system in the mouse brain and published this about 10 years ago. And this is um, an image of the medial prefrontal cortex and how the projections from those neurons go into the brain when there's no dopamine transporter and when the mouse is wild type. And I'll play that one more time. This is our injection site. This is the projections of the medial prefrontal cortex into the brain when there's too much dopamine with a dopamine transporter knockout and when there's the right amount of dopamine, less dopamine. So we can see that the dopamine system is regulating the prefrontal cortical projections or influencing it. And these projections are going down into the limbic system of the mouse brain. So we expect the same thing is happening in human. We're now doing, we've now engaged in um, brain-wide mapping of neural activity using manganese as a calcium mimetic and manganese as a paramagnetic ion, it reports on neuronal activity in the, in the brain. And so we've been able to map various types of experiences. So before the experience is blue and after is red, and we can see that there's activation in the nucleus accumbens, in the ventral tegmental area, and back here in the periaqueductal gray. And then we can wait nine days and take a look again and see if that activation has persisted. And what's really scary is, that it does. Once you get activated with a strong stimulus, that activation persists. Not only does the activation of these neurons persist, but it changes the projections from the prefrontal cortex. And so with our prefrontal cortex tracing, we found that before the experience, the, the tracings go to these regions, and after the experience, they are redirected to the periaqueductal gray and the hypothalamus. We know these are areas of um, these are areas that coordinate the limbic system and its response to, and this is in, in this case negative input. And so I'm going to play just a little bit more of one of my pieces. This is from the Magdalene Passion, which is an hour-long oratorio that was conducted by Julian Wachner and performed in Pro Providence by the Providence Singers. I'm gonna get <laughs> Bye. 
So um, this is a, a piece that was commissioned by the American Chemical Society and performed there by Victoria Bregan, who received, who won the um, Van Cliburn Piano Competition Award a few years before that. just do a tribute to um, Buckminster Fuller, quoted by David Baltimore at Caltech, and you can read it. I think we scientists know this. We know it's right when it's beautiful. And a composer and the audience feels the same thing. We know it's right when we feel joy. And this is Nadia Boulanger. Um, I, uh, this is a photograph taken by a friend of mine when I was in Paris studying with her. And this is our Navajo blessing. Beauty is before me and beauty behind me, above me and below me, covers the beautiful. I am surrounded by it. I am immersed in it. In my youth, I am aware of it. And in old age, I shall walk quietly the beautiful trail. In beauty, it is begun. In beauty, it is ended. So now, Lewis, can you introduce our panelists quickly? And we, we can begin with the questions. Uh, we have Fred Chang, uh, violinist. Um, he is a professor in the UCSF Department of Cell and Tissue Biology. Jonathan Davis, PhD 96. Dave, uh, Dr. Davis is the president of innovation and strategy at uh, Invera. Uh, Jonathan Goldstein, he is our percussionist um, and uh, he studied music at Stanford University um, and earned his degree in 207. And Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, David Harrington, violinist. And David is a founder and lead violinist of the San Francisco Grammy winning uh, Kronos Quartet. So I think uh, one of the first questions I wanted to ask the panelists to discuss was their ideas about emotion and music and how does it, um, how does it play into when, what pieces for example, do you, David, pick for your Kronos Quartet to, to play? What, how does it play into Jonathan when you're conducting an orchestra and you're picking a piece for that? And how, Fred, does it play in your life when you're picking uh, music to listen to? I remember Fred and I went to hear Chuck Correa play in, uh, in the village. I think it was at the Village Vanguard or the Village Gate. I can't remember which one of those jazz venues. And it was a quite exciting evening to listen to Chick Corea. So there's all sorts of music out there and different types give us different joy. So maybe David, can we start with you? Well, I, first of all, Elaine, I'm just overwhelmed by uh, your talk. So it's, uh, it was amazingly interesting to me. <laughs> and I just, uh, I wanna learn a lot more than I know. Um, I mean, I, I was thinking about this because yesterday um, was the birthday of uh, a person that made probably my favorite human made musical note and her that I know of. Of course, um, there's so much we don't know, but this particular note was made by Isabella Panosian, and it, it was from a recording in uh, 1917 of a song by Komitas, 
And of course, this was shortly after the um, uh, tragedy of the Armenian genocide. Um, and Zabella Panosian lived in, in New York. She went into a recording studio and made this song. And I invite everyone in the universe to listen to Grung, G-R-O-U-N-G. You can hear it on YouTube. And not only do you get to hear this note I'm talking about once, you get to hear it twice in this song. And um, if I ever write a novel, it's going to be about that note. Because for me, it says so much about life, about humanity, about um, tragedy, about survival, uh, about aspiring to something um, that surpasses um, tragedy. Um, and I find it incredibly hopeful that some, some young person would go into a recording studio and make a note that over a, a hundred years later, every time I think about that note, I get a chill in my back. And basically all I want to do, I, I feel like I'm a listener of music. And I use the violin in order to be in a string quartet because when I was 12, I fell in love with the E flat major core opening chords of Beethoven's Opus 127. And I had to do that myself. And what's happened in my life since then is I run into things that I have to do myself. <laughs> I, I just get so um, magnetized and after I heard Isabella Panosian, I knew she had to be in one of our pieces. So I had to find a composer that would uh, be able to in naturally incorporate that note, <laughs> let's say. And we ended up playing a concert in Yerevan, Armenia, uh, uh, marking the 100th anniversary of the, the beginning of the genocide. Wow. And um, so, I mean, I could talk for hours about things like this, but that's why I do music and that's uh, why I get pulled to things in the world of music. <clears throat> wow, thank you, that was wonderful. I, I got a little flustered at the end of my talk and I forgot we were gonna do this B flat first before we did discussion. So, but I think what you just had to say David fits really beautifully with the idea of our doing B flat. Do you know what the pitch of that note was? Was it B flat by any chance? You know, that's a good good question. <laughs> I should know and I, I don't know, but it can be discovered easily enough. It's very high. <laughs> oh yeah. So um, uh, Jonathan Goldstein is our percussionist and he could accompany us on B flat and this wonderful, uh, comments that David Harrington made about Armenia and a pitch that brought together all the feelings. Um, maybe, maybe that would be that that would be something inspirational for us to start on this B flat. Um, we have some singers in the audience who are going to be able to sing a B flat. Are you guys ready? Give us a B flat. <laughs> are we ready? Okay, so. Um,
all well. I feel like I sang too loud. Now I should not sing at all and let everyone else sing. Has everyone had a chance to make a noise? There are 110 of you out there. I don't hear 110. So Jonathan, I, I, I loved it. Um, so people should be able to see Jonathan Goldstein. He's there somewhere close where you can all see him. And he's going to improvise to our B flat. And he, hopefully that improvisation will inspire you to do more with your B flat. You could try different vowels. You don't have to do. It could be all sort. It, you can also sing the overtones that you hear on the B flat. You can sing. That's the third. You could sing the fifth. You could sing the ninth. You can sing the seventh. So let's try again and, and let Jonathan inspire you and let's try to keep it going until we come to some consensus of all 110 of our voices. Here's the note. people still are muted so you, if you're singing and you're muted fred <laughs> we could um unmute so that we can hear you um it's important if you don't ha that you not have too much noise in the background otherwise you might get a pauline oliveros type effect of a happening rather than a nice sonorous b flat so uh so let's try the, th the last time the third time uh, we will we will try our B flat and um, let's see if we can sustain it for at least three minutes. And I think Jonathan is kind of trying to crescendo during the three minutes so that if we don't keep it up for three minutes, he won't reach his maximum. So let's see if we can keep it going for three minutes and take off your take off your mutes and give it a try. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
recorded and everybody can listen and see themselves <laughs> it will be fun <laughs> and then now let's go back David had a wonderful contribution um, and Fred would you like to jump in now and talk about answering this question about what music means to you and what it, emotions it, it brings out and how that feels sure um, hi everyone hi Elaine it's Wonderful to hear all your work, and um, it's very exciting to think about how the brain is lighting up when we hear music. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I connected to your thoughts about how memory and music might be connected. And that's one reason when I listen to music or play music, um, that it, it brings up all these different memories for me um, throughout my life at different times in my life. Um, so I had one vignette, which was just some years ago, um, I played camera music and I started playing this piece uh, with friends, um, it was the Dvorak uh, bass quintet. Um, but it wasn't a piece I had, hadn't, I had not played it since I was 16, I think. And, um, you know, there's a, I think a theory in memory where your memories are, if you, if you think about it, your memories are constantly being rewritten, right? So your memories, if, if you constantly listen to something, your memories are being overlaid with this. But this was a piece I hadn't really thought about or played since I was 16. And so what that day when I started in my 40s or 50s or whenever, when I started playing it, all these memories of being 16 rushed back to me. And I started playing differently. I, I held myself differently. I started playing like in this, I used to play with this violinist, um, you know, when I was 16 and I started playing like her and it was all very subconscious, um, but I just had this very strong rush of memories of what it would be like to be that young again. Um, and over and over again, I do have these very strong memories of that come back to me when you sort of revisit these old pieces of music to, to the point where I think you know, a lot of my sort of core memories that I still remember when I was young come from music and playing the music, so. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> that's, that's what that um, light up picture that I showed, like the familiar music lights up some areas and novel music lights up others. Yes. And, and if you can listen to music that incorporates both of those, then you get this, uh, harmony in your brain with both things happening. Right. And then tr truly, when I go to concerts, I love going uh, to hear new music that I've never heard before or that as no one has ever heard before. And um, this that's totally different to my brain. And um, Do you remember that Chick Corea concert? Yeah, that was <laughs> fun. <laughs> I still have that recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jonathan, you haven't had a chance yet to speak on this. 
Jonathan Davis. Um, yeah, hi, thank you for uh, inviting me to join this panel. Uh, I'm a cellist and you know, just speaking of memory, I'm a cellist and uh, my mother played violin and my father piano. So I grew up playing trios, piano trios and all those great classical piano trios are you know, in my heart and my mind that I, I'm back in my living room with my parents playing and it's wonderful. Um, but I wanted to also talk a little bit about the emotional part. I, I think that, you know, emotion, you know, music can be written to pull a particular emotion. And you see that in like movie music. Uh, but there's a lot of music is not, it, it's very strongly emotional, but not everyone is going to react the same way to it. And there's another aspect as well, which is uh, the emotional state you're in can have uh, can can drive what the music does to you. So I have a, an experiment to suggest everyone to try this. Find a beautiful piece of music. Probably anything by Schubert will do, but it could be kind of anything. And um, but that's not lively and not sad, just beautiful. And listen to it while thinking about something that you feel very strongly, whether it's, you know, something really sad, like the death of a loved one or something uh, really wonderful, like, you know, you're falling in love or uh, whatever it may be. So, and, and think about that feeling, not, not about the event, but about the feeling that the event inspired while you're listening to the music and see what happens, uh, because it can really be uh, a really profound experience. Um, there's a story about Ben Zander who conducts the Boston Philharmonic that he would take like kids off the street, you know, you know city kids had never heard of classical music and you, know, you play Chopin for them or something and they're gonna you know, roll their eyes. And he said, instead, he said, you know, think about something really intense, uh, you know, like, Jonathan, I think your mic cut out. But it's interesting that you bring up your mother's playing because um, Jonathan's parents, his, his father was uh, chair of microbiology at Harvard and his mother was a violinist and they, had, they were always at Woods Hole. Jonathan is at Woods Hole right now. And I used to play string quartets with Jonathan's mother um, at Woods Hole in the summers. We were all doing science in the daytime and we played string quartets at night. So overlooking the ocean was really a wonderful time. So David, I'd love to circle back to you while Jonathan's trying to get his mic working again and, and hear some other thoughts you may have. On, I think one of the questions I really wanted to ask you was your Kronos Quartet has done a lot of ethnic music, a lot of music from places all around the world. I love your CD, The Silk Road. Was it? No. Um, uh, and, and another one we have of African, African composers that was very unusual, but also very accessible. So I'm wondering, how do you pick that? And how, do you, um, how are you picking these ethnic pieces? What do you look for? Well, what, what I'm always searching for would be music that uh, pulls, pulls me to it. And in terms of, of making a concert or recording, it would be uh, like you mentioned Pieces of Africa, that album from 1992. Uh, well, I was aware of, even as a kid that there was no African string quartet music. It did not exist. Yeah. And at age 16, I realized one day there would be African string quartet music and I was going to find a way to do that, to make that happen. And it took many, many years. The first African string quartet piece written for Kronos was in 1984. And so, and then, and that was by Kevin Volans, who was born in South Africa. And then it was Terry Riley who introduced me to Hamza Eldin, who lived in across the bay from San Francisco. And then my sister told me about 
Dumasani Mata Iri, who was teaching up in near Seattle. And slowly, it, it didn't start as an album, it started as one piece and then another. And then at a certain point, uh, we put several of them together and realized there's a sound here, there's a feel that does not exist anywhere else in the music that we knew of. And so then, yeah. uh, and basically that's how everything we've ever done <laughs> happens. It's um, starts out as a question or, or trying to fill in a blank and then it begins to grow. And sometimes we get suggestions by our friends and sometimes I might run into something um, and find a way of bringing that into our future work. <clears throat> I, I know another piece that I just love that you guys played by Yanov Yanovsky. Yes. Lacrime. Yes. That was really wonderful also. And he's at Uzbekistan. He lives in Uzbekistan. I've had some email correspondence with him over the years. He's incredible. Yes. And uh, as you say, very amazing uh, composer. His father was a wonderful composer as well. And um, um, you know, the, the, that's one of the great things right now is that we can be directly in touch with musicians from so many different backgrounds. And, and um, so the world of concert music to me is, is, is it's beginning to take off. It's beginning to be um, projected into the universe in a new way right now. And I, I'm very, very happy to be able to be a part of it. <laughs> So I guess if we're coming to the end of the time we have maybe only a few minutes and I had there was one question that came from participants that came from other people. What is the if if we could study music's effect on the brain, what is the most burning question we would want to know. So I'm going to I don't know if Jonathan's been able to get his his uh, Internet working again, but Fred, why don't you comment on that and and then David I'll come back to you. There's so many questions. Um, I mean, I, I like the what things you're looking at with how does it connect up with emotions, I think would be a, a great thing to look into. And it gets into questions of consciousness and every, other big questions like that. But yes. Jonathan? Yeah, I, I would I would like to know what is it that uh, gives some people like Mozart or Bach just such insane ability to create the music without even having to try. You know, how, how, can, how can our brains be so well wired that we could do that, that some people can do that, but very few of course, but just there's, you know, I always think of things from the evolutionary standpoint, what, what could possibly be an evolutionary advantage of being able to create music like that, but, uh, it's there. It's in. It's it's in us. I'd like to know that. What do you think, David? Well, I was I was able to ask uh, Noam Chomsky uh, what it was in a concert that he and his wife went to in the late 1940s. Uh, they heard Pablo Casals play Bach in a cathedral in Fran uh, France. And I happened to hear him say that that hearing that music in that setting at that time changed his whole life. And when Kronos was invited to play um, at MIT, I agreed to do it only if we could have Noam Chomsky as our guest artist. And we, we did not have a chance to have a rehearsal, but I was able to ask him to please explain to the audience how music could lead to activism, a life in activism. Yeah. And for me, uh, you, you can hear his um, response. You can find that concert on, on YouTube, actually. Um, did he answer the question? I'm not sure. <laughs> he, he, he did as good as anybody could do, and it was amazingly fun to, to do that concert. 
That was amazing. <laughs> well, there was one question that I that I saw from the audience or from the participants that was about rhythm and why rhythm, the rhythmic components of music make us feel like dancing and is the rhythmic components of music good for Parkinson's disease. And um, I don't, I, I know there's some people trying to investigate rhythm and using dance music type things to help with Parkinson's disease. Now that we know that music activates dopamine centers, Parkinson's disease is a disease of dopamine. So maybe that's one way that music helps with Parkinson's, but I don't know about rhythm. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe Fred, you can say something about ry rhythm or Jonathan or David, whichever one of you would like to comment on rhythm. Well, once uh, we were invited to play uh, at a uh, Parkinson's, um, it was an exercise or dance class. And they had been using some of our music in their class. And we got to meet them and actually play live for the class. And it was one of the most amazingly beautiful experiences. The, the response to music was so personal and so uh, instinctive and natural. Um, I mean, I can't say anything more than that because I don't know anything more than that. But I, I just wanted to say that, that um, I would do that every day if I could. <clears throat> What is the natural rhythm? I mean, the fundamental rhythm in our bodies is our heartbeat, right? Mm. And it can be fast or slow. And, uh, and you know, the next most fundamental rhythm is probably our walking, our stride. But then we can, that one we can control and we can start adding counter rhythms to it and turn it into a dance. And you know, why do we dance? Well, why do animals dance? Animals dance to show that they're healthy and get a mate to want to be with them, right? And I think people do the same. So uh, it, I think that you know, it's sort of fundamentally inside of us is this uh, a desire to express rhythm with our bodies as a way of showing that we are healthy people and we are, you know, we are uh, you know, maybe attractive. And uh, that's that's been read into us and it, it comes out in tapping your feet when you hear a good beat or just feeling like you just have to get up and move your body. You know, I think I should ask Jonathan Goldstein since he's our percussionist about rhythm. I think that point that um, Jonathan Davis made resonates with me for sure because when I think about the pieces of music that um, excite and inspire me the most, of course, as a percussionist, they often have a strong rhythmic um, drive to them. Uh, a piece that I was thinking about earlier when, with one of the questions um, for me that always sort of um, gets me excited about, about music is Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. And it has such a primal um, rhythmic drive sort of throughout the piece. And I think it really taps into this idea of rhythm is not um, some sort of external construct. It's actually kind of in, in, our, in our bodies, in our in our emotions in our um, daily lives. And I think that's, you know, when, when we play music, whether it's dance music or something that has that sort of rhythm to it, it really kind of, I think creates um, like, a, like an easier way for us to grasp onto it. And, and to that point, you know, get up and dance or move our feet or, or sort of uh, express this natural um, energy in, inside of us. So. And Fred? I guess I was just thinking how, what other animals or other life forms respond to rhythms as well? And do they dance? Um, and do they respond to the same kind of music? As, I don't really know, but. I don't really know. But w what I'm hoping, and, and we can't uh, extend and explore this, but I, we're talking about animals and we're talking about is music appreciated by animals? And I think there's a lot of evidence that, to suggest that it is. 
I read a wonderful book by Stuart Mithin, who's a linguistics person who talks about the language of hum, which is apparently something that he believes the Neanderthals were capable of communicating using hum, which is pitches and intonations without articulated consonants, because apparently their, their hyoid bone or whatever wasn't in the right place for articulating. Um, and so with pitches and intonation, they were able to communicate. And would that be a music or would that be a language? Can you say the name of the author and the name of the book one more time? Stuart Mithen, M-I-T-H-E-N, and it's called The Singing Neanderthals. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. It's really good. <laughs> well, I think we, we've gone as far as we can go in this amount of time, and I think we've seen that there's an awful lot more to do. There's a, a lot more to know and a lot more to sing. Um, so I want to thank everybody for attending. It was really great to have such, such a large number of people, and I'm looking forward to the recording. Somebody asked me if they could see um, my it could see my talk again. Well, that will be in the recording. And I also have a, a number of YouTube sites with similar talks that I've given over the years. And my music, um, some of it put to video, like the deep piece that I showed you at the end of my talk. So um, thank you.